Welcome, everybody. It's good to see real people in real life. And uh, as we mentioned before we began here, I mean, this course was previously a uh, special topic uh, course, but then uh, we decided to turn it into a regular course and with more project-based approach to it. And uh, one of the things we thought of doing today is both to uh, uh, map out the project, which, we're going, which is going to keep us busy the rest of the semester. And then we should also discuss the final exam form. And since everybody's here now, we could also discuss, I mean, project groups and things you would like to diversify into after, uh, let's say, the, the Easter break. But the the thing which Stian and I wanted to do today, so Stian uh, has, is actually doing quantum computing on his PhD thesis, and uh, he has uh, put up uh, notes on Qiskit, which uh, is going to make life easier. The alternative is obviously to uh, write everything from scratch yourself, like you have in, in this textbook by Hunt. So that's another alternative. But with Qiskit, you can actually implement all the gates very easily. Because the other, if you wish to build up many of these things for yourself, that is a master thesis topic. And we, we have only 10 credits. So there's a, yes, Greg? I would actually not recommend implementing it straight away like no. Hunter because yeah. he's following the Google yeah. programming style. And yeah. It's not the best coding style that I have yeah. seen. Yeah, my it's very black box and it's, yeah. it becomes slower as. Yeah. I agree, I agree. And Qiskit is a kind of standard which you will encounter. And uh, and that means that we can focus more on building the uh, computation of a specific quantum mechanical system. So our emphasis for the, for the start here is actually to uh, use a uh, quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, which uh, some of you have met before if you took a course in many body physics, which is called the Lipkin model. So the Lipkin model is normally presented in terms of uh, second quantization operators, but you can rewrite it in terms of spin matrices. And uh, the spin matrices can then easily be implemented in terms of specific gates and circuits. So this is a kind of uh, uh, material we wanted to prepare today. And then there are two main algorithms for dealing with uh, the calculation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So one is called the variational quantum eigensolver, which is the one we normally would like to recommend. But then for historical reasons, there's also another one, which is called the phase approximation method, the phase estimation method, uh, which also utilizes the uh, quantum theory of Fourier transforms. So next week, we will cover that topic as well, so that you uh, get to see how to represent Fourier series. Uh, via gates and circuits, which is also extremely useful. And uh, then we hopefully by the end of next week, we will have gone through the material which is needed for you to be able to start with the with the, with the project work. So that's the kind of ambition here. And then uh, that defines uh, uh, where we can go this semester. And we should also try to discuss uh, during. So today is going to be more kind of workshop like but also lecture-like. And uh, when we, uh, during breaks and so on, we can then discuss also the uh, examination form, so, which is uh, most of you are not too happy with a uh, fine, only one final exam, but that we could actually share the load between projects and the final examination. And that's something which we need to determine. And also when we want to have the final examination. Okay, so uh, uh, what I want to do now is just to say a little bit more about gates and circuits. So I'm going to use uh, roughly the time before 12, roughly, and then we uh, move on to Qiskit after, after we're done with the uh, basic discussion of gates and circuits, because there are some gates which are essential to understand how they function, because that's the way we're going to simulate a quantum mechanical Hamilton. So I'm going to switch to the... Uh, to the um, whiteboard, if that's okay with everybody. So let me do that. And last week, what we did 
was to look at these one qubit gates. And I, I wanted to quickly remind you of some of the material. So we have the, this is parts of this is just a quick reminder from last week. So one qubit gates. And these are often uh, written in terms of uh, this kind of drawing. So we have a box here. That means that uh, if you want to uh, be more specific, you could think of a state, the initial state, phi. So this is a one qubit state. It could be 0, 1, or it could be a linear uh, superposition of 0 and 1, which are the computational basis states. And then we end up with a phi prime like this. And then there's a gate in between here, which we just call for G. So G is a, uh, so these gates are unitary transformations. So we have to keep that in mind that this, uh, what this actually means mathematically is that we have a, a unitary operator which acts on the original state and produces a new state. Now, the uh, some of the standard gates uh, which we have encountered. So let me just quickly remind you of that. And also let us quickly remind ourselves that this state here, since it's a one qubit state, this could be a linear superposition of uh, the uh, computational basis states, zero and one. Remember also that these are just uh, approximations to a realistic system. So a realistic system, this state zero and one, they could actually be either single particle states of which you have an infinity, or they could be complicated many body states where you have picked out only the lowest lying states. So this is often done uh, in most textbooks and then it, everything gets disentangled from the physical world in the sense that uh, uh, in the physical world, we don't have two level systems. These are just idealizations. So here it serves our purpose of identifying a computational basis state. And the uh, kind of gates which we met uh, is the sigma x, which is just a poly x matrix. And you will often see that written as an x. And that flips a qubit. So that flips a qubit. That means that if you have a qubit in uh, a state zero, it flips it to state one. And if you have a qubit in state one, it flips it to state zero. So just as a quick reminder, this uh, you will see it rewritten as an X gate. And so this is our gate G, or this unitary transformation. And if that acts on a zero, no, sorry, not like that. So if you act with this one on a state zero, that gives you a state one. And obviously if you have the linear combination here, so if it acts on the state phi, this simply gives you alpha zero multiplied with one plus alpha one multiplied with zero. Then we have the other famous Pauli matrices, sigma y, which is often represented just in terms of y. And uh, that is a gate which uh, flips the component and multiplies it by an imaginary i. So this is, does the same, it flips a qubit, flips flips a qubit and multiplies it by i and multiplies it and then we have the sigma z gate which is often just written as an uppercase letter z and that changes the uh, the phase of a qubit. So just to quickly remind you, if I act with a sigma z on zero, that gives us zero. And if I act with z on one, that gives me minus one. Then we have the identity matrix that leaves the qubit in the same state. We have something which is called the S gate or the phase gate. So these are some of the basic gates, which uh, are universal ones. And you can actually build up all other operations based on these simple gates here. So the S gate, which is normally written as an S, is given by one, zero, 
zero in I. And then we have the uh, different projection gates. We have the T of uh, I divided by eight. And I have to give you what this means. This is called a T gate. So it is a rotational gate actually with a specific phase of pi divided by four. In general, what we have are the so-called rotation gates, where this is a special case of these rotation gates. So this R of K, when we're coming back to these gates, is given by E to the two pi of I divided by two K here, two to the power of K, sorry. So these are just examples of operations which you will encounter. So the state of a qubit uh, can be represented as a unit vector on the block sphere, which you probably have seen. And when you apply a transformation to a qubit, what it means then is that the corresponding vector on the block sphere is also transformed. So that means that uh, these different rotations represent, if you think now of a, a vector on this block sphere, then when you do perform this rotation, then the vector will also be transformed. So these are one qubit operations. There's also another famous gate, which uh, we are going to encounter again and again, and that's the Hadamard gate. And that's what brings in a superposition. So if I have uh, this H, so I just represent it like an H here, when I act on zero, this produces a superposition where these states have equal probability. So it's a state zero plus one. If I act on one here, this is given by one over square root of two. And then I have zero minus one. And then you can rewrite this as a two by two matrix, but it doesn't need to be a two by two matrix, it can be a four by four can be an eight times eight, et cetera, et cetera. So this goes in the, in powers of two when it comes to the dimensionality. So as a, as a two by two matrix, so you can represent everything which we're doing now in terms of uh, linear algebra operations of matrix vector multiplications, one and minus one. There are some useful things now and uh, there are some relations here, which uh, we are going to encounter again. So if I have a subsequent set of unitary transformations. So when you read this one, it means that you act with H on the state and then with the Sigma X and then with H again. This is something which can be simplified to a Z gate. So it's easy to see that when you do the algebra here. And I leave that as a kind of smaller exercise. And if I take H with Y gates, this is the same as a minus Y, which is also the same as an X times Y times X. Now, this becomes important because when we are setting up gates to perform simulations, uh, every simulation which you perform here means that uh, the state you're simulating on needs to have a certain lifetime. So from a physical point of view, if you want to make a quantum computer, then you need actually to have uh, gates and operations which are short. So typically these gates can be implemented by applying lasers to, uh, for instance, ions, which are trapped in small regions. And then by applying a lasers, you can excite an atom or an electron to an excited state, which will be the other computational state. And uh, if you perform many of these operations, the system can actually, since many of the states have a limited lifetime, you're very sensitive to that. So in the search for ideal systems for quantum computing, uh, for making the devices. So if we now forget about the mathematics, for making the devices, uh, there's a lot of sensitivity on the length of a given circuit. So like Stian has been on his PhD, he's actually working on using machine learning to shorten the length of the computations. And that's so if you have these operations, if you just set up these operations in a meticulous way, you can actually shorten them to shorter uh, operations. So similarly, you have an H times Z times H, which we're coming back to, which can be rewritten just as an X gate. So this was just a little bit about the one qubit gates. 
And then the two qubit gate, which we discussed last week. By the way, I am gonna put up some of these rotation mat matrices. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let me just re remind you of something which we didn't do last week. So we have these rotation matrices or, or rotation gates. So now we are going to identify these matrices with the gates. And we have the rotation around the x-axis of, of an angle theta. If you go into textbooks in mathematics, you can actually rewrite this one times the identity matrix minus an i times a sine of theta half multiplied with a sigma x matrix. And you would typically rewrite that one if you, the way you would typically see this in textbooks is as a cosine theta half minus i of sine theta half minus i of sine theta half, and then you have cosine. So I'm just setting up the definitions here, assuming that many of you may have seen this type of uh, rotations before. This is in turn given by a cosine theta half multiplied with the identity matrix. So these are two by two matrices, minus i times sine of theta half multiplied with a sigma y matrix. And this is a rotation around the y-axis. And we have seen this before because this is a matrix which goes like this. This is a standard rotation matrix. If you're using a method to find the eigenvalues called Jacobi's method, which many of you may have encountered. So this is also called a Jacobi transformation or Jacobi rotation. And then we have the RZ matrix. And all these uh, matrix operations, they have uh, some uh, uh, nice features which allow us to compress the circuits. And this is now given, I'm just setting it up here, e to the minus i, theta half, zero, zero, of e to the i, theta half. And there are special variants of these. So we would have uh, uh, this matrix. If I take uh, this uh, matrix T, which we defined earlier, and mm -hmm. multiply with the Hadamard matrix, that can be replaced by a rotation around the x-axis with an angle pi divided by four. And uh, there are other relations which I'm just stating here. So if I take sigma x and multiply that with a rotation around the y-axis, sometimes you may set up circuits which do these things. And this would be typically minus theta. And then there is a sigma x, an rz of theta of sigma x. And you can show that this is the same as rz or rotation around minus theta. We are coming back to some of these things. But then the thing which we looked at last week, and this is basically where we ended. So we have something which we call the two qubit gate. And the famous one here, there are many variants, is the C naught gate. So when we look at the sigma x gate, that functions as a not gate in classical electronics. So you send in bit zero, it gives you bit one and vice versa. In classical electronics, you'd need a not gate and a so-called NAND gate to actually construct all kinds of circuits which you want. So these are normally called universal gates in classical electronics. Now in uh, quantum computing, the C not gate plays the same role as the uh, NAND gate. And uh, the way this is set up as a circuit is in the following way. So let me just remind you of that. So we have a so-called control qubit or control input. And you can just write this as x. And this comes out as x. So nothing changes. But then what is interesting is actually the operation you can now do here which plays the role of a logical AND operation, or NAND if you prefer. And you have a target input. Sorry. 
So this is a given state Y. And then what you get out here is some, so this operation here is the same as addition and module two or module two. So you have two numbers and then you take modules two and then the reminder is either zero or one. And this gives you a transformed of bit, which is now the cross product of X times Y. And if you now look at uh, a specific state, what happens now, it has the following, if we are sending in this as a state, so this means that you have X and Y here. So this is the input state, which is the tensor product of X and Y. So these are all always states which are composed of more than one qubit, which means that when you look at what is coming in here, it's not that you have two qubits which live separately, but you have prepared a state here, which is actually the tensor product of X and Y. And the tensor product of X and Y is something which I write, or this would be actually zero for a specific system A, tensor product with zero of a system B. So when this is the input, what that produces as an output, so this is the output here, this produces zero and zero, so it doesn't change anything. So you could now think of that as A here and B. So this could be your control input, and this could be your target input. So in many of these realizations of these uh, type of systems, these are normally systems which you can think of uh, ideally as independent of each other and distinguishable, which means that uh, you have within the uncertainty relation, you can say that for instance, an electron is in system A and another electron is in system B, and you can treat these as distinguishable systems. So that's an important premise premises for the for many of the things which we end up doing. And then we have the same here with the uh, state zero one. So I'm just writing it in this shorthand way, if that is okay with everybody. So system B has a bit one and it ends with bit one. So nothing happens there. As long as uh, the state uh, in the control input is given by zero. And then, or next is that if I have one zero, this changes to one one. So that will be the same, uh, the corresponding operation to a NAND operation, except that uh, compared to the classical operations, this is a fully reversible process. So everything you're setting up here in order to be a quantum mechanical unitary transformations. So the way you have to think of it, even if we write it like circuits, for those of you who are more hands-on quantum mechanical physicists, this simply means that we are performing unitary transformations on a given initial state. And you will see that in some of the gates later in the circuits, that these are just repeated unitary transformations, which means that the operations have to be irreversible. So quantum mechanics is in a way like classical mechanics, that there is a determinism, except that there is a probabilistic determinism. So when we then use the outer products, we can actually write this gate, C naught. This is now going to C not. This is something which we would rewrite as the outer product of these four possibilities which we have. So you can really design these gates in terms of uh, these outer products depending on what you have and what you want. So that becomes uh, zero, one with zero, one. But then we have this uh, new state where we have one zero, which then goes to one one and plus, and then we have one one, which goes to one zero. And then the, the only thing we need to do now is to set up the matrices which result from these operations here. And then we know that if we look at this guy here, just as an example, this is the outer product of uh, one 
no, sorry, zero, zero, one, zero. And then obviously, since it's an outer product, it's zero, 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 one. And then if I set up the, the matrices, and it's always useful to set up these matrices. So that means that the, my final gate, G, C naught, can then be represented by a four by four matrix, which looks like this. Nothing happens with the controlled input qubits, but then something happens with the, with the target qubits. So in the beginning, when you're thinking of gates, it's very useful to actually set up things in terms of that. So if I have an initial state now, so suppose now that uh, these two initial states, if we look at this X and Y, these two states here, let's just write these in terms of two general states, which uh, can be a, in a superposition of bit one and bit zero. So I'm gonna let this X go over to a state Psi so this is a control state. And this could be in a superposition. It doesn't need to be just one qubit, in one qubit state, but it could be a superposition of uh, zero and one. And then we take this y and label that as a phi. And that could be given by beta zero of zero plus a beta one times one. So that means that the initial state, which we had, which corresponds to these distinguishable systems, is simply going to be equal to the tensor products of these guys. So I'm going to have an alpha 0, beta 0, alpha 0, beta 1, and then I have alpha 1 of beta 0, and alpha 1 of beta 1. That's just the tensor product of these two states. So it's a little bit repeat on what from we did from last time. And when I act now with this one, so I'm just going to write this in a compact notation, phi of psi. What I get then is a phi of psi primed, which is now going to be given by this uh, GC naught acting on this original state. And that gives us, when we now perform the calculations, it's gonna give us something which is changed for the two last elements. So I'm gonna have alpha zero, beta zero, nothing happens here. Alpha zero, beta one, unchanged. But then what I have is that I have alpha one times beta one and alpha zero, alpha one times beta zero. So the two last ones have been interchanged compared with the two previous ones if the state was in a superposition here. Now you can make many more such gates. So you can have a control Z gate, you can have a control H gate, et cetera, et cetera. So what you could set up now is something like a control C operation. So let's just do further examples here. Oops, that one. So we can set up a control Z operation. And that means that they have a control qubit here coming in. And that uh, is labeled by this uh, filled circle. That is unchanged. So I just leave it at C for control. And then I have a target here. And in this specific case, I have a Z gate. And that produces a state here a T prime state. So we know that the, the uh, with the Z gate, what happens then is that zero goes over to zero. But then what happens with one is that that goes over to minus one. So this is not a C not a gate, gate, but it's called a controlled Z gate. You can make a controlled Hadamard gate, you can make controlled rotation gate, et cetera, et cetera. And these are all types of rotations where you involve two qubits. And these become important when you want to simulate a quantum mechanical system. Now, what we want then is the following type of operations. So we would like now, so the zero, zero is obviously unchanged. 
So think now all the time that this is the control qubit, the same here, and this is your target. So this is C, which we have here, and this is the target qubit. Then we have um, the next operation, which is a uh, zero one, and this is also unchanged to a zero one. And then we are performing an operation now with a one zero, which then stays as a one zero. But then if we have a one one, we want this to change to a minus one one. And then you can set up the uh, operations again. So you can now define this uh, G control, C for control and of a C gate. And that will again be given by zero, zero. So this acts as a projection in a way. Plus is one, zero, one, zero. Plus, or oh, rather minus, sorry. And this should be a minus. One, one, two, one, one. And that means that the gate is going to look like as follows. It's going to have a one, zero, zero, one. It's going to have a one here, minus one, zero, zero. And you can write this in a more compact way as, and now we have an I2 here, which is the identity matrix of a dimensionality two times two, zero of dimensionality two times two. And later, I'm just going to skip the subscript two because it's uh, e, we don't need that one. And then we have a sigma C matrix. So that would be the more compact way by which you could write that one. Now, there are operations, uh, and this is something you can show. Uh, if you now construct it as this, it's easy to show actually, and I'm gonna leave that as a small exercise. So this is the control qubit. This is the target qubit, target prime. This is actually equivalent to um, you having a C gate here. It's actually easy to see that by just setting up the gates here. And uh, this is normally written as follows. Another thing which you can show, and uh, you can construct a C not gate also as it follows. And I'm also gonna leave these, uh, some of these operations as exercises. So what you could do now, and now we're getting closer to what we will call a quantum mechanical circle, quantum mechanical circuit. So this is the C naught gate, which we indicate by this plus here. This is equivalent to our first encounter with a circuit here, where we have a, a state, the target state, which is operated with a Hadamard matrix. And in here, it now is replaced by this operation here, which corresponds to a C matrix, a control C. And then we have an H here. So this is also something which we can uh, uh, rewrite in terms of um, a uh, control Z gate. So if you're Looking at, if you look at this gate here, you see now that you have some of the basic gates. You can actually rewrite this uh, uh, C naught gate in terms of a Hadamard gate and another Hadamard gate, and then this CZ gate. The, um, uh, if you want to look at that, uh, you can just perform the operations. So I leave this as a kind of small exercise to you guys. We also have uh, other types of you can actually set up any type of controlled H operate control gates. So you have a control H. So that means simply that the control qubit doesn't change. But something happens with the target qubit. And uh, 
this would be written as this. And then you would have an H here. So this is again your control qubit, and this is your target qubit. Which means that mathematically what we want to do is the following. If we have zero, zero, then we end up with zero, zero, nothing happens. If we take zero, one, what we end up with is a zero, one again. And then if I take the one, zero, what happens then is that this moves over to square root of two. And then I'm having zero, no, sorry, one. write it correctly so this would be uh, so I have a state here with one zero so that becomes one and zero and then I have plus one one so that's the change I'm going to do now on the second qubit on the target qubit so the control qubit stays the same and similarly if I look at the one one here that changes to one over square root of two and then I have a one, and then this changes to zero, minus one, one here. And you can uh, rewrite this as a following uh, matrix. H becomes then equal to one, zero, zero, one, zero, I'm just writing it as a block two by two block. And then I have a Hadamard matrix here. So I have one over square root of two, one over square root of two. And we would rewrite this in terms of uh, an identity matrix of dimensionality two times two, zero matrix of dimensionality two times two, times an H2 matrix. So originally we started with a four by four matrix. And this can be rewritten as a diagonal and a two by two uh, other matrix. Okay, so this was a kind of just uh, uh, making a kind of encyclopedia of what kind of operations you can expect. So these are gates. But the next thing we want to do is actually to make up circuits. And when Stian is going to talk about Qiskit, this is actually the thing we are interested in. So if we move from gates to circuits, the way you can look at it is as follows. So you can think of different stages and every stage represents a unitary transformation. So if we now look at two qubits, so let's stay with two qubits because that's often simple. And you would have some kind of initial state which uh, refers to one of the qubits. So now it doesn't need to be a control qubit and target qubit. So this could just be a two qubit system which you have prepared. So you could think of uh, two electrons being in a harmonic oscillator well, each one of them in each well. And both of these electrons are in the lowest lying state in the harmonic oscillator. And you could think of this lowest lying state as zero, zero. So that's the way uh, you could now prepare your system. And then you can start exciting the system. So that means that you would have something like this coming in. And we, so let's, so this is the input. And then we have the uh, first stage. So let's just set up an example. So the comes in as an input. And here we have a Hadamard gate which just acts on that qubit. That obviously produces, uh, so this is stage one. So I'm gonna put a subscript to one here. And that means that it's gonna be a linear combination of these uh, states. And similarly, we could now think of this uh, second qubit, which is also being manipulated with a Hadamard gate. This is just an example, right? And that produces a phi one. And this, this leads to uh, later to stage two here. But let's try to um, just rewrite the way it's gonna, the operation is gonna look like. So this gate, which we are going to apply now, G1, G1 for stage one, 
is now going to be the tensor product of uh, two Haramad gates. So I have a, a two by a, a vector length two for each qubit. It means that the state which I have is a vector of length four. I need a matrix of dimensionality four by four to act on that vector. So that means that my G1, my first gate, has to be then represented by the tensor product two Haramad gates. Then I have the next stage, which could uh, look something like this. So this could be a C0 gate. So let's uh, put it like this. So I get the Psi1, which feeds in. So that produces a Psi2 here. And since this is a C0 gate, it means that Psi2 is equal to Psi1. Nothing happens with Psi1 here, because that's the control qubit. So in this specific case, this is the control qubit. But then I have the uh, operation here, this. And this produces a phi 2, which is obviously different from phi 1. So this is something which I'm going to call stage 2 here. And stage 2 has a gate, G2, which is just this C0 gate. And then before we take a break, the uh, next thing which I could do now is the final stage. So let's change color here. So my final stage would now be a uh, Hadamard gate here. And that produces I output phi three, phi three. And finally, I could also have a Hadamard gate here. So this is, uh, there's nothing special with this case. It's actually just an example which I cooked up. And that gives me a phi three. So this is what we would call then, so let's put dots here. So that receives as an input psi two and phi two. And this is the final output. So the way we could now represent this one again is a G three, which is actually given by H tensor product with H. The Hadamard gate. So what this means is that what we have in these different stages is a final gate G, which is going to be given by obviously G3. This is the last one, and G2 times G1. So what we can do then, if we want to do this in a stupid way we can actually just perform three matrix matrix multiplications. And if we do that, we are going to get a final state, which we are going to set up after the break. But what you have here is the basics of a typical quantum mechanical circuit. Now, this is just an example. When we are going to look at specific systems, we are going to tailor these kind of circuits in order to solve, let's say, a quantum mechanical money particle problem which will be more the focus in this course. So, I mean, how to solve quantum mechanical problems with quantum computing algorithms. So, these are just examples of gates. And uh, uh, in a way, it doesn't look very exciting if we just disentangle this from all the possible physics applications. Actually, the interesting physics is to make these gates, which is highly non-trivial. And actually, that's where we'll have a lot of technological developments in the future. So I'm going to pause. So if you look at the, this example of a, of a kind of circuit, which is made of the two qubits, we could now think of these states being in a kind of superposition uh, in the, from the beginning. So if we want to be general, what we could think of then is that we, that we have a, in the stage one input, what we have now is a state uh, for the one qubit, which is uh, tensor-producted with the, with the other one. 
we could now think of this as this state C1. And the uh, next state, no, sorry, C, not C1, but C. And then we have the uh, uh, result, which is now given by this uh, G1, as we wrote it, times the original state. So that's the first unitary transformation we are performing, where this G1 was a tensor product of two Hadamard matrices. And uh, uh, the original states could be something like this, with this psi, which we are feeding in, which is equal to some alpha zero. This is a very general superposition of uh, the two qubit computational basis states. And that means that uh, when I now perform the operation on that one, this is clearly, it means that this psi one, which we would get, oh, sorry, the, the phi one. No, I'm looking at the wrong notes here. So this phi state could be equal to a beta zero plus a beta one and one. And then we know that when we operate in the uh, uh, cross product of the Hadamard gates, so this G1, which is now two Hadamard gates, this would be something like one half. And when I now set up the uh, tensor product of these matrices, one, 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 minus one, we get one, 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 minus one. This should be minus one, minus one minus one and one. That's what the tensor product of two Hadamard matrices looks like. So what I would get then is that the new state, the output from these operations is gonna be given by this G1 times the original state. That was the first stage. And then I have stage two. And then I have my G2 now, which is given by the C0 gate as we live up here. So this is the uh, C naught gate, which we had here. This is stage two. So that matrix is just given by one, one, zero, 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 zeros, and then zero, one, one, zero. And then the final matrix G3, or the final operation G3 is actually equal to G1. So what we need to do then is just a matrix matrix multiplication. That means that uh, the state two here, which is a tensor product of the uh, two. This is now simply gonna be given by G2 times G1 times the original state here. And then finally, when I look at my final, final output here, this is also a state which is a superposition. So we haven't done any measurements here. So the one thing which I didn't put up here is uh, the measurement symbol, which I'm coming back to before Stian takes over now with Kiskit. So this will simply be given by G3 times G, G2 times G1 and multiply with the state. And if I set up this matrix, this matrix is actually going to look like one divided by four. And it's going to have four, zero, zero, zero. It's going to have zero, 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 four. If I did the matrix, matrix multiplications correctly. And clearly that becomes ones because we have one divided by four. And this is multiplied with the initial state. And that initial state, so this becomes equal to one, zero, 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 one. And then we have to multiply it with the tensor product of these two states. So this is alpha zero, the initial states, alpha zero and beta one, alpha one, beta zero, and alpha one, beta one. So this is the way we can now represent the final product of that circuit. So note here, there is no measurement.
So if you want to do a measurement, this is typically marked in the following way. So suppose if we do it at the one qubit stage, we would then have a gate like this. We could have several gates operations. We could have an X gate, etc. And then we would mark the measurement. So this would be states which are superpositions. And then we perform a measurement here. And then we have a final output. And in that case, the output is uniquely defined. So we have an input which can be a superposition of states. It could be a pure state, it could be a mixed state, but it is when determined, we you know the input. And then we can produce entangled states, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have an output when we perform the measurement with a given probability. As we discussed some weeks ago, when it came to the definition of the measurements and the operators linked with that, which are then given by projection operators, which then have a given probability. So this is a typical way you would actually draw a given circuit when you perform a measurement of one. So the examples which I had here, the stage one, two, and three, this is actually in order to prepare the state for the specific superposition. And you will see that when we come to this Lipkin model, that is something which allows us to set up the state uh, in a, uh, using gates. We can actually set up the system in a specific state, which we're interested in. So this was uh, uh, the basics about gates and circuits. And then what we thought of doing in this course here is that, so you can have different paths actually. Uh, one is to use Qiskit when we are solving a problem. The alternative is also to try to write a code yourself for the different gate operations. That's another possibility. So we're going to outline that when we write the final first project path here. Uh, we are going to change a little bit, but if you if you go back to the uh, weekly slides, so let me just stop that. So if you go to the weekly slides this week, I have baked in uh, Stian's uh, slides here on quantum gates and how to use Qiskit. But I guess you have changed this a little bit, right? Uh, I have actually not gotten much time okay. to do that. Okay. Um, I had uh, to... Um... Uh, there was um, mandatory assignments yep. in the other course I had to finish up, so. But if you want to, you could say something about the, so Stian has actually developed the first notes here. And then uh, after that one, there is a discussion of this type of Hamiltonian, which is called the Lipkin model, which I thought we could look at a little bit later. And, and but we are going to continue with that next week. Uh, but Stian, you could just take over here and I'm going to, un to mute myself, uh, just gonna leave the audio here. Are the talks for Qiskit as well written as those for NumPy? Hey, say it again, uh, are the talks for uh, Qiskit as well written as NumPy? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So one thing we could do is actually to ask everybody to download Qiskit. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm going to unmute myself here. Yeah, yeah, because you're going to speak. Uh, oh, by the way, let me... Or could I talk through the Logitech? Yeah. You can take the Logitech. Uh, let me give it to you. Because then I'm going to leave the audio. I'm just going to mute myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, I have to leave audio. Okay, right now. Yeah, can you hear me, Frida? Yes, it's good now. Okay, good. Good. okay so um, I've written together a little uh, introduction to Kiss Kids. Um, 
Uh, I uh, think you have the uh, notes available yeah. to you, uh, but I may just go go through it all and explain. So I'll start from scratch again, uh, and uh, we could start by just uh, making sure that you all have the uh, correct packages. So it's just uh, NumPy. Uh, and uh, this it. And I can go come back to the, there's some optimization algorithm. I can come back to that, but it's important that you have NumPy and Kiskit. And mm -hmm. if you have a debug notebook, I think you can just uh, use this line to install Kiskit, but you have to remember to do it before, before you try to import Kiskit. Um, so do you every one of you have pieces or do you want to just uh, try to follow without programming yourself or I'll just follow it out and then yeah. I'll look at the uh, yeah. video again. Yeah. Um uh, okay, so the first uh, step in uh, trying to do the actual operations that Morton has uh, shown is to uh, you have to define the, the circuit how many qubits you want. Uh, as well as how many classical bits you want to use, because when you do a measurement of the of the quantum system, you want to sort of encode the results to a, to a classical register, so you can save the results there. Um, so uh, the first uh, step in creating your quantum circuit is to uh, define the number of qubits you want to use. Uh, so in the first example, uh, as written down in the notes, I just want to uh, use a one qubit system. Um, and uh, the next step, and also don't be afraid to tell me if I'm going too fast or if something is unclear, uh, because I didn't have limited time to, to prepare this, uh, but I'll try my best to explain the steps. Um, so, um, in order to create a circuit in Kiskit, you will have to define something, uh, something that is called a quantum register. Uh, this is just, this is just a way to sort of organize your system because you could have a system with a hundred qubits, but all the qubits have different purposes. So you could uh, create like five different registers out of the hundred qubits. If you want to, uh, or you could just make one register with all the qubits. It doesn't really matter, but it could be easier if you wanted to say apply a Hadamard gate to all the qubits in one of the registers and not do anything with the other registers. Uh, but I'll come back to that uh, later. Uh, so let's see. This is the way to define your quantum register with one qubit. Um, and you, as I told you, you also want a classical register uh, to encode the results to when you do a measurement. Uh, so I only have one qubit, so I want to measure that one. So I will use one classical uh, bit. So uh, it's good. Should yeah, I just slow do down or just go? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, so uh, the next step is to define your circuit. So it's with this functionality called quantum. Sorry, not register. Quantum circuits. And this function wants, uh, you can use as many arguments as you want in this function, you could, or a class, you could uh, have a hundred different, different registers there. Uh, but in this case, we'll only input uh, a quantum register, the made and the classical register. 
Um, and then we are ready to do operations. But first, we will just use the draw functionality to see how this quantum circuit looks like. So you see that there's pretty much nothing there. Um, you could also, I believe, uh, it doesn't really matter, but I think you could just use print circuits as well. Yeah, that's the same thing. Right, so uh, to do an operation on the qubits, uh, you have to use some functionality of the quantum circuit class. Um, you could pretty much do all the uh, operations that Morton has defined with more. Uh, you can do multiple qubit gates uh, as well, but first we'll just do an X gate. And how this uh, works is that you have to uh, specify which qubit you want to act on with the uh, how the X gate. Uh, and you can just use as an input the quantum register and specify with an index which qubit you want to, to apply the gate on. In this case, it's just one qubit in the register, so you don't really have to specify anything. Um, let's see. Yeah, so now you can see that you have performed an unlocked gate on the qubits. Uh, you could also, for example, apply the Hadamard gate by changing, changing this to an H. Uh, then I'll have to run everything again. So could you just give it a special value just to see what it gives you then? Uh, so if you give it zero just to see that you get bit one, the output. Oh, to see the, the output? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, but before, uh, we want to, uh, in order to get the output, we have to uh, apply a measurement gate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if it's actually a, a gate, a quantum gate, but you at least specify that you want to perform a measurement on a specific qubit. And this is the way to do that. You have to specify, let's see, which register or which qubit in a register you want to measure as well as which classical bit you want to uh, encode the results in. So we can see how the circuit looks now. So you see this M with a line down to the classical, classical bit there. Um, and uh, the, with Qiskit, you are able to uh, run your calculations on your own computer during a simulation. Uh, and you are also able to uh, send the results, uh, not send the circuits to an actual quantum computer all over the cloud. Uh, the way you use the program is not really different either way. So the only thing that's different is uh, which backend you use. Uh, and the backend is sort of, you want to use a, Classical, uh, classical simulation of a quantum computer, or want to do a noisy simulation of a quantum computer, or do you want to run it on a cloud, uh, on a quantum computer on a cloud? Um, so, in order to uh, actually measure your circuit and run it, you have to specify where you want to run it. And uh, let's see. And today, I think we'll just use uh, this uh, backend here. Um, it's called the QASM simulator. It's just a simulator that you're running on your own uh, laptop. Um, the thing is that if you try to run 20 qubit uh, circuits uh, with this simulator on your own laptop, you probably won't get any uh, results in a while. You have to wait. Uh, but for small problems, it will be fine most of the time. Gotcha. 
Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's just the QAS and uh, simulator, which has a uh, little difficulty with the number of qubits, or should you just go to IBF cube when you uh, pay a large number of qubits? Um, so uh, the problem is uh, I don't know if they have any uh, limitation on the amount of qubits you have to use, but probably your uh, memory will run out uh, yeah. if you increase it. I got uh, a trillion uh, nine bits, uh, like short nine bits of the Okay. And it took forever and yeah. almost always crashed. Yeah. Uh, is there any, do you know how to? So nine qubits should be possible. I don't know. It it depends on how uh, how large the circuit is. Yeah. Um, but I mean, when you see that it goes uh, really slow, you could try to do some um, transpilations on with which Kiskit allows you to do, which they try to uh, limit the size of the circuit by replacing gates. Um, to see if that works. I don't really know how uh, how many or the circuit depth of your algorithm. I don't know, but it was quite well ago. But yeah. Um, yeah. you could run it on the cloud, but I mean, you would get probably full results because then there's noise. Because here you're running this ideal simulation, uh, which means that there are no noise uh, at all, and you get sort of the ideal results that when you run it on their quantum computers you will get uh lots of noise so then you will need to do the error correction yeah, the yeah. yeah but probably <laughs> there's probably i don't know exactly which algorithm you made but uh the you have to apply gates and measurements to do the error correction right mm -hmm. yes yeah so this will also induce noise, so you yeah. might not get the perfect results either way. But uh, for now, we'll just uh, do, uh, deal with uh, like two qubit systems. So, so, so this is something we haven't discussed yet uh, about noise and uh, error mitigation in quantum circuits. So the way you can view many of these actual implementations is as complicated many body systems where the uh, computational basis states can be ruined by thermal excitations. And that gives uh, noise in your calculations. Mm. So that's something you have to live with, with the present day technologies. Maybe we could have something about noise uh, as a kind of uh, continuation for the, uh, for the project. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's sure. something we could add and so because it looks like I just looked it up, it doesn't seem like we have any limitations in our project and how many qubits we can use in the I mean. <clears throat> hey, because I just looked it up. Always speaking of the limitations of this quantum computer. It doesn't seem like there are limitations to what we would apply. Uh no, there might not be, but again, uh the limitation is the computational yeah. time. Yeah, so yes. Uh, I, I, it should be fine with eight qubits, de depending on the algorithm. Yeah, but uh, I meant like the quantum computer at IBM. It doesn't seem to have any limitations in a quota if we were to send it over there. Oh, yeah. So so they, the limitation there is uh, they don't have a uh, thousand qubits quantum computer. No, available. but I think like they have a hundred and something. So I yeah. think we'll be using the systems at large. Mm -hmm. You cannot access that unless you okay. pay. So we have a five qubit machine which okay. we can run things on, and that's the uh, that's the free or the free and open cube. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's also a, yeah. sort of a limitation, not with the hardware itself, but okay. if you use their quantum computers, you will have to yeah. wait in line if okay. you don't get any uh, any. Uh, if you don't have any, uh, what's actually uh, explained, um, prior, prioritized uh, work that you want yeah. to do. Yeah. So it could take uh, longer to run it on their computer than on your own laptop, actually. And also, uh, IBM doesn't, doesn't give uh, access to everything. Yeah. So it's normally 
your lab or university has to get a collaboration agreement with the IBM, and then you can apply and get accounts. And, but you still have to pay with your research grants. So the University of Oslo, I think the non-Nordic Norwegian University yeah. have any agreement with IBM. Uh, what about machine learning nodes that uh, the university is available if we or in an instance would to be yeah. to run out of yeah. uh to uh, meet a limitation on our own computer. Yeah. Absolutely, you could use those nodes that which runs on GPUs as well, because essentially many of these algorithms are just basic matrix 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 like the multiplications. So oh, I don't um I assume that we would also get some noise from there, but would it be as much as if we were to send it all the way to IBM more? So the IBM machine, the thing is that these computational basis states, they are actually extracted from complicated many particle systems. That means that when you have thermal excitations, the system may not be in the state zero and one due to thermal excitations. And people see that because when you perform operations, if you're, let's say you're running with a Hadamard gate or one of these rotation gates, and you want an output which is 50-50, you may get 45, 55. And that depends on whether it has been recalibrated and how many people are actually running. So if many people are running, then thermal excitations are more likely. And then your computational basis is just ruined. You don't have it actually anymore. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is uh, everything uh, good for now? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the next steps is uh, going to be to actually uh, say that I want to run, run this circuit because as for now, I've just specified which operations I want to do in the future, but I also have to run it and measure the qubit. Uh, the steps I all the steps I'm going going to write right now I'll, I'll I always have to cheat and or Google it um, because I don't remember them so I don't have any specific explanation for the steps. Um, but af after you have specified the backend you want to use, you have to uh, run the circuits. Uh, so and this shots parameter is important uh, because when you are running quantum circuits, you most of the time want to have um, uh, you want to have a st statistical uh, uh, or you want to have a yeah how do you say it um, an average yeah an average of the results. So if you for example apply the Hadamard gate here, it should make a a, a superposition of zero and one with equal probability, and you won't be able to say much about what has happened with the qubit if we just measure it one time, because we'll get a, either a zero or a one. So what you typically do is you run the same circuit over and over again. Uh, and here I specify that I want to run it a thousand times. Um, so, Thanks. So what I'm doing here is to just get a dictionary with uh, the uh, measurement results. Uh, so let's see. Um, things. Yeah, or maybe I should call this one counts. Counts. Yep. So. You might notice that I'm not getting a 500 zeros and 500 ones, which you should expect with a hammer gate. And this is because the because um, uh, you will only get 50-50 if you measure it uh, an infinite amount of times. Uh, so, I mean, you could be unlucky and measure zeros a thousand times, uh, but it's uh, not very probable. Just run it for 10 there, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you see it. So here I got lucky. I got the uh, perfect results, but yeah. 10,000 in just, yeah. Yeah, I can do 100,000. Yeah, yeah. So you'll we'll get scale. closer and closer to, and it will take longer and longer time, of course. Yeah. 
is you know, like you're tossing the coin and you know the more times you toss it, the higher the likelihood for getting 50 50. And also one important thing to say about the circuits is that the qubits are always uh, initialized in the zero states unless something else is specified. Uh, and you are also always me measuring in the uh, computational basis and the computational basis is the eigenstates of the Pauli set of rhetoric. Um, you could also measure in some other basis, which I'll come back to later. Um, so let's see what is the next step. Um, should I start right away with two qubit circuits? Um, Take a small break because it's 12 o'clock. And then people can stretch legs and then we begin again quarter past the hour. Is that okay? Yeah. And then we just see how long should, what we thought of doing is the that we present case here. And then we could practice a little bit. And then uh, uh, some few simple exercises. And then next week, we try to apply it to the quantum mechanical money body code. Instead of overloading with too many things. Just take a second. Just put the, put the recording on pause. It's the end. Is doing this because I stopped, but then uh, the sports are going. You know, so, what we're going to do is to uh, continue with the KISS kit demonstration. Uh, Stian will also introduce the VQE uh, without you having seen it before. And then we're going to pick it up next week uh, and discuss it in more detail. So, at the first, we are going to throw you in deep waters. But hopefully we can come to your rescue. And then next week we will go through in, in more detail and link it up with the with the first time we show you which we're going to look. Yeah. First question a question about the drawing. We have uh yeah. uh by line out twelve. Uh the classical bit starts to one, and then when we have the line down for measurements, it we have a zero right on it. What does it mean in terms of the drawing? Does it mean that does it mean that the class a bit generally from zero to from one to zero, or is it just zero out of measurements? So, I call, I call it. so, um, I think I'm not, I'm not 100% sure, uh, but I believe the one, uh, is uh, how many classical bits you have okay. in the register. So, instead of drawing a line for every classical bit, you just uh, it tells you how many you have. Uh, we can uh, confirm this later when I introduce more of them. Uh, the zero, I believe that it will encode the results to the zero classical. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Okay. You can do that. Um, so, uh, okay. So, um, we can go to several qubits too, maybe. And then I'll just uh, follow the same, uh, the same procedure. But change these variables. It doesn't seem to be popping oh. your screen yet. Okay, screen sharing pauses. Now, okay, so I'll just jump to the two qubits case and I'll also uh, measure both of them. So let's go. So that's two uh, two qubits in the quantum register and two classical bits. I could have chosen one classical bit if I only wanted to measure one of the qubits. Yeah, so now you see that you have uh, two qubits here. Um, I wouldn't care very much about these numbers here. Um, I believe they, uh, 
the, the name of the previous circuit was uh, saved in uh, memory and it uh, decided to call this Q2 instead of Q1 up here. Um, yeah. And uh, now you see that we have the two here by the classical uh, register. So that's probably because there's two qubits, no, two classical bits now. And uh, have have you gone through the bell of states or something? No, we didn't yeah. the bell states yet. So we could, uh, since we have two qubits now, we could uh, make a circuit that sets up uh, one of the bell states. Uh, and the first step is to apply a Hadamard gate. And I'll apply this to the first, uh, first qubit. And next step is the C not gate, which is it C not or C -X. C X? Thank you. And then you have to specify which qubit you want to have as the controlled qubits, and also which qubit you want to use as the as the um, target qubits. Uh, let's see. So here you see. You can also change this to the. C set if you want that. Let me see the symbol that Morton drew for the controlled set gate here. Uh, but since I want one of the best states, I'll take the C not gate. And let's measure both of the qubits. So now you see that uh, from one of the qubits, you can go to the zero uh, classical bit, and for the other one, you encode it to the, the next classical bit here. Right. I'll just copy this. So uh, I'll increase the number of uh, shots here. So you see that you have um, you should have a fifty fifty distribution of uh, of uh, so zero zero and one one since you have the states. Uh, you of course you don't get any information of the face uh, um, of the face uh, of the the states. So uh, you can't say if this is really zero zero plus one one or zero zero minus one one or yeah. Um, okay, what's well, that? Okay. Um, let's see. The next uh, thing I could show is uh, you also sometimes want to apply just the rotation uh, to the qubit, which Morton talked about with rotational gates. Um, so I can show how to do this now. So I use the circuit of clear, I believe. Uh, to erase what I've done. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm going to do the uh, Rx rotation. And uh, with some, let's see, uh, let's say uh, rotational angle of pi divided by three. And I uh, also do this to the second qubit. And let's say, let's say it drops. Well, Right, so let's measure this circuit and see what we get. So 
So what's important to notice here is that um, I don't know exactly why this is, but I applied the uh, rotation to the second qubit and not the first one. But as you can see from the results you print out in the classical reg register, the first classical bit has been rotated while the second one is only zeros. So for some reason, when you get out the results to classical bits, the results are sort of uh, flipped. I don't know why, but uh, it's, uh, I think I spent a couple of weeks not understanding why my results were wrong uh, when I implemented something. But I mean, the, there is probably a logical reason why they do this, but it's also important for you to remember. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, in, in the blocks, we're we rotating by the, the amount of the x axis. Mm. Yeah. And I just have to convince myself. Why, why, why the values would be such as you said that? Yeah, so this specifies the rotational angle. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I can also change this, let's see. Um, and then we get uh, the 50 50 results if it's with a 90 degree angle. Would be that you're measuring in the uh, basis of the new rotated phase mm. bit. No, this, this is this happens no matter what you do to the qubits. So let's say I now specify a 10 qubit register. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to copy paste. And uh, let's say I take a uh, X gate on the final few bits. Mm -hmm. Register size error. Should this be too many qubits? No, just a little name or see what see and see this on the first second line ah thank you oh yeah so even though i flipped the i would think that this one we're supposed to be a one but it's not mm -hmm. so what i do when i if you just flip this third one the third one. This. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so it's consistent at least. Um. Uh, so uh, it doesn't matter. I just keep it in mind and I flip the string if I'm gonna do some pre-processing of the results. Uh, maybe you could do something like just this. With it, not gonna it, it reverses the list. Yeah, so maybe yeah. that will, yeah, that works as well. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's much more to go through here. If you don't have any questions about. About the details, mm -hmm. or no? So, should I try to go through the QE here, or did you think of doing the two by two matrix? Yeah, because then we can rewrite that as a sigma x and sigma c matrix. You, were you planning to do that? Uh, so uh, I'm just going straight to the Hamiltonian in terms of the. 
uh, in terms of uh, probably, yeah. uh, I can show you. Let's see. Because we, we can link it also to that simple example, which we discussed in the beginning here. Yeah, I can do that. So. Because when you have a two Hamiltonian problem, you can rewrite that in terms of a diagonal matrix plus a sigma Z matrix plus a sigma X matrix. So you can actually rewrite as 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 the system is setting up here. Yeah, so when you are uh, going to use a uh, quantum computer for uh, finding the eigenstates and eigenvalues of a Hamiltonian operator, you will probably in most cases have to rewrite your Hamiltonian in terms of the Pauli matrices, which you could do with uh, all Hamiltonians written in second quantization form. Um, so what I've done here is I've just written out some arbitrary matrix, which is a sigma set gate acting on the uh, first qubit, as, as well as a sigma set gate acting on the second qubit, and uh, x gate and a y gate, uh, or x gate tensor y, y gate. Uh, and uh, let's see, I can maybe use this. Uh, in here. No, I, I actually went, I wanted to see something, but then I, no. Yeah, so what we want to do is we want to uh, variationally try to find the, the uh, lowest uh, energy or, and the eigenstate corresponding to the lowest en energy of this Hamiltonian operator. And, uh, oh, sorry, now you can see this. <laughs> so we have, um, so this is a two qubit system. Uh, and these C, Cs are just some arbitrary uh, constants. You have Always sets sensor identity, so it's just a Pauli set acting on the first qubit. And then we have Pauli set acting on the second qubit. And the final term could be uh, Pauli x other y. There should be a three here. So what we could do to try to find the, the lowest uh, eigenvalue of this Amazonian is we could define some uh, some quantum state, which is dependent on some rotational parameters, uh, this, which we are going to vary to try to find the lowest energy, energy. And what we will use is that This is the expected energy of the of the system, uh, and we are able to uh, estimate this on the quantum computer, and then we will just vary the the. Uh, oh. I don't know what happened. This was. Get it? Hmm. Okay, That's strange. So, so that I thought this works. Uh, you have an iPad, right? Yeah. You want to try my iPad? When I zoom in and out, it yeah. just some yeah. places skip. You want to try my iPad instead? Uh, yes, because maybe I'll try it. Yes. Yes. Because if you stop, if we just stop sharing, we could just use my iPad. Yeah. So if you just uh, stop sharing screen, so let me let me just remove mine, and then you could actually rewrite it. You could just do mine. 
actually the one of the things you could do, and we we will discuss that next week as well. If you look at the, um, the matrices, which are an even simpler case, is actually if you think of a typical Hamiltonian problem like this. So where you have a non-diagonal elements, and you assume that these are emission ones, then you can rewrite the non-diagonal term in terms of just the Pauli matrix, sigma x. And then you can rewrite the diagonal ones in terms of the uh, uh, diagonal matrix plus a sigma c matrix. And then you have a Hamiltonian, which is uh, suddenly rewritten in terms of uh, this uh, basic universal gates, which you can think of. But Stian, I mean, just go ahead here and we can just use this one. Yeah. Just... yeah. So, I mean, I could start with something even simpler, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, let's say you have some just this. Uh, yeah. Let's just start with a one qubit problem. I guess, uh, and we can. So the Hamiltonian is just a constant uh, multiplied with a, a Pauli set matrix. And we want to try to find the lowest uh, energy eigenstate and lowest energy of this uh, matrix. So to do this, we define some qubit states, one qubit states, which is dependent on some parameters, theta. Um, and we will measure the energy. So the expectation value of the energy is this. Um, as long as the states are normalized and they are on the quantum computer. And uh, if you are, you are maybe familiar with the variational principle, but the energy cannot be lower than the lowest, lowest possible energy of the system. Uh, so we'll have to find a way to uh, measure the Hamiltonian using a quantum computer. And uh, what's convenient about uh, the the uh, how this set matrix is that the uh, computational basis is actually in the sigma sets uh, or are the eigenstates of the sigma set. So what this means is that if I uh, just uh, perform a measurement on my uh, quantum states and I get uh, zero, I know that it's in the uh, eigenstates of the sigma set operator. So uh, maybe I'll write this down. So you have uh, sigma sets on, and I'll just go back and forth, just writing with a set and sigma sets. Uh, so if I act with a sigma set on the zero state, I get just zero with an eigenvalue of one. And if I act with the sigma set on the one state, I get minus one. So the computational basis is the eigenstate of eigenstates of the sigma set operator. And what this means is that if I just measure my quantum state and I get a zero, I know that uh, the measurement result is the eigenvalue plus one. And if I measure the state and get a one, I know that it corresponds to the eigenvalue minus one. Uh, and if I just choose to measure again and again and again, I can calculate the expected value of the sigma set operator. So, for example, if I measure a quantum circuit or this state, If I measure this state uh, a thousand times and I get, let's say, I get a zero uh, 400 times and I get the one state 600 times, I can uh, calculate the expected, uh, the expected value as 
So it's one multiplied with 400 and then plus minus one multiplied with 600 divided by the total number of times I, I measure the circuit. So this is just the expected value of the eigen values for the signal set operator. Uh, this will just be an approximation, but if you measure uh, uh, infinitely many times, you will get uh, closer and closer to the actual results. Um, and uh, so this will be so the expected value of the sigma set operator. And then I just, to get the expected value of the Hamiltonian, I just multiply this with C1, like this. So that's the way to measure the, the uh, uh, this particular Hamiltonian up here. Um, and what I could do, I didn't write this down, but this is actually a function of the parameters in the in the quantum state here. So what I could do is I could do this uh, experiment repeatedly and just vary the, the, the rotational parameters eta until I find the lowest uh, energy. And if the quantum state is flexible enough, it should be uh, able to find the actual ground state energy. Um, when you have a Hamiltonian, which is sort of a sum of more terms, so it could be C1 set uh, plus C2, yeah, let's say set here as well, you could use that the expected value of the Hamiltonian is C1 set. So it's just the sum of the individual expect expectation values. Uh, however, since you're doing not infinitely many measurements, this is just an approximation. So this is only true in the uh, in the case where you get the exact expectation value. Uh, but it will either way be an approximation when you're not, not doing infinitely many measurements. Um, Okay, so is there anything that's unclear about this? Yeah, should I continue this? Yeah, I'm again? just are you sharing this one and then. No, I can. Uh, okay, or uh, I can just go through one yeah. more thing. Yeah. Um, there is also, uh, as you maybe uh, did see from the Hamiltonian I wrote down, it was not just uh, a Hamiltonian which included the poly set matrices, but you also had the poly uh, X matrix. And in that case, the computational basis is not the, the, uh, the eigenstates of the poly X operators. So it's, you cannot find the expectation value in this simple way by just seeing how many times to measure zero and measure one. Uh, however, it's uh, the poly X, as these eigen, eigen uh, states. these two eigenstates. Um, and one thing you could do to measure the, the uh, expectation value of the poly X operator is to perform a uh, basis change. And to do this, you could see that if I call this, and call this, um, let's say plus, it's maybe usually called plus or minus these two. 
you could see that if I use a Hadamard gate on the plus state, I get a zero. And if I use a Hadamard gate on the minus state, I get a one. So what I could do when I want to measure the poly x uh, eigen uh, or poly x expectation values, I could just uh, apply a Hadamard gate to the qubit I want to measure. And then I know if it's in the plus state, it will I will measure the zero. And if it's in the minus state, I'll measure a one. So I just sort of, I always measure in the set basis, but I apply a transformation, which uh, uh, makes me able to find the expectation value of the poly X operator. And I'm not going to show this, but with the value of Y, the transformation you could perform is the S, dagger gate and the Hadamar, and you will get the same behavior. So in this way, you are able to measure any sort of Hamiltonian, which is composed of all the matrices. Could, could I add one thing? Yeah. Because the, if you look at what this Dian said now, and if you spool back to what we discussed in the beginning of the semester, in terms of uh, uh, what you may have seen in basic quantum mechanical courses, so you, you just need a link here. So if you think of a, Hamil a general Hamiltonian, which in this case is a two by two Hamiltonian, it would look something like uh, a single particle energy, perhaps. There may be some interaction matrix elements, V0, you may have a non-diagonal one, V10, and then you would have an epsilon one plus V11. And typically, this Hamiltonian would be rewritten in terms of an unperturbed part. Or it doesn't need to be unperturbed, but it could just be a diagonal part. Plus a term here, which you could call for interacting part or just a non-diagonal. So in this case, you could think of this H0 as just being epsilon 0 plus V0, 0, and epsilon 1 plus V11 1, 1, and 0, 0. Now here, there's no problem in diagonalizing because you have the diagonal eigenvalues on the diagonal values on it, so you have the eigenvalue. And what you could say now is, if you use a computational basis of zero and one, you could now say that the first state is now this uh, H zero acting on zero is now given by epsilon zero plus v zero zero and multiplied with zero. You can actually rewrite this term in terms of a diagonal matrix in the sigma Z matrix. We will discuss that a little bit more next week. And then you would have an H01, which you could then, so this is your computational basis, which uh, Stian mentioned. But now when you plug in the non-diagonal part, when you diagonalize, so the full Hamiltonian, when you add this H1, this is the one which ruins your computational basis. So this will be given by zero, V zero, one, V one, zero, and zero. So when you diagonalize the true eigenstate, psi zero, is going to be a linear combination of alpha zero, zero, plus alpha one, or one. And then you would have psi one is equal to beta zero. So when you diagonalize, this is what you get, of beta one times one. And if you go back to what Stian wrote here, uh, what we can do now is actually to play around a little bit, because if we only have, if you look at this part here, if now these matrix elements are the same, you could actually rewrite this as sigma zero one times sigma x. So this would also have this computational basis as eigenbasis states, and it's the linear combination of the two which gives you the full interacting form. So this is a standard way by which you normally have seen things in the courses in quantum mechanics. And then this is a simple case, it's a two by two matrix. You can find the eigenvalues analytically and eigenvectors as well. Uh, but when you do this in terms of quantum computing, the whole thing is now is that you actually want to rewrite the Hamiltonian in terms of the poly matrices. And that's the, uh, the trick which we are going to apply to this Lipkin Hamiltonian next week. But the basics, as Tian says, and when you, we are going to run computations now where we measure the expectation value of the 
sigma X and sigma Z matrices. And we're going to make some circuits where you can actually perform the simulations. You would like to continue? This is just more to bring back. Yeah, I can. The, uh, you want to switch to the screen? Yeah, I can yeah. Uh, switch after. Uh, so it was just to bring back the similarity between the traditional way of thinking and where you actually have a computational basis and the new co new computational basis, which is essentially just the same. Just the way you rewrite what you've seen before. Yes, so we could for um, for simplicity just uh, have a um, one qubit system. Uh, so I'll just rewrite this on the to make it a bit simpler. So So let's say we want to find lowest eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian. Um, as I said, in order to measure the in the, the measure the sigma uh, x uh, expectation value, you have to just apply a Hadamard gate to to the qubit you want to measure before measuring. Uh, but also, we have to find a way to set up this uh, this uh, variational states. Um, we will and. To implement this, we will uh, just use some uh, rotational gates, uh, which I showed you how to apply earlier. So let's first just create our circuits. Then I will define the ansatz, the wave function and ansatz or the variational wave function we wish to use. Um, and I just want this function to return the circuit. I wish to uh, the the circuit which which I wish to um, uh, measure. I guess. Um, so uh, let's say I act with the Rx rotation gates with theta, and I want to act on the just the one qubit I have. So, so. so I just say that I want to apply a, a half uh, rotation. Maybe I should take just some multiple of uh, by third. And I just want to have one qubit. This is how the circuit looks like. Just read really a simple circuit. And if I now want to uh, go to the Pauli X basis, I have to act on this circuit with a with a with a harder market. So let's see, I can move this down here. And then oh, sorry, I think I'm doing something stupid there. So Um, okay, so so this just re returns. Uh, I mean, I create an empty circuit in here, and then I just apply a, apply a rotation gate. So this just will just return uh, this simple circuit, um, and I want to add this to the empty circuit I've defined here. Uh, it may be a sort of uh, 
a clumsy way of doing it, but I will continue anyways. So I can use something called circuit.compose. It will just combine two circuits into one. Um, yes, let's see. And then I'll act with the hub and my gate on the circuits. So let's see. That did not work. Yeah. Oh, sorry, this is not in place. That's fine. There. Okay. So just uh, because I thought that I jumped sort of back and forth, is uh, is it clear what I'm doing? Okay. And um, the next step now is just to measure and. Uh, I will just copy this again. So you might have noticed that there are not any classical bits in this circuit. And uh, the reason I didn't include this is just to show that you can do this later because you don't, you sometimes want to do, you measure several qubits, not several circuits that are similar, but you want to measure different sort of qubits uh, in the different uh, executions. So uh, first, before I'm sure, I need to add uh, I need to add a classical register. This. Yeah, now I have the classical bit there. Now I can apply the measurement. Uh, measurement experience. Oh, sorry, I'm actually getting ahead of myself here. Okay, so. Um, Maybe I should go from from scratch. So maybe you could say a little bit about why you simulate the uh, that specific uh, poly matrix in terms of a rotation and how the mod. I guess I I don't know if everybody got that. Okay. Yeah. So um. So the the first thing I want to do is, of course, I want to measure this Hamiltonian. So what I'm doing is that uh, I want to have a variational state, which I can vary some parameter uh, until I find the uh, eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And uh, the variational state uh, I want to use is just the uh, this simple circuit. So uh, let's see. So this simple circuit, a rotation uh, around the x-axis with some specified angle. And I want to be able to uh, vary this angle till I find the lowest energy of the Hamiltonian. And since I'm measuring in the x basis, I have to apply a Hadamard to the qubits before I uh, measure. That way I can just measure how many times I get zero and how many times I get one uh, and find the expectation value like I drew on the iPad earlier. So So the complete circuit just looks like this. I apply an RX gate, take a Hadamard, and then I measure the qubits. And then I see the, the counts here. Just see if I get actually the correct behavior now. Does it look a bit strange? Strange. 
My hypothesis is that you measuring the basis of the gate you already applied, and when you use Hermard on that gate and measure in the Rx by third uh, basis with Hermard, you find <coughs> of normal state or uh, in the block sphere, which means that you get an even number of ones and zeros, mm -hmm. which would imply that above when you found the erroneous results with which bit you measure, measured in implied that when you measure in the R, Rx by third basis, everything gets kind of shifted. Does it make sense? Uh, I'm not sure if I, I understand completely. Um, I don't know if I'm correct, but it seems like it measures in the Rx basis that you define. And that when you do a mod operation on it, you find something more normal to it and you get ones and zeros. Like yeah, so in, so you mean if I take the Ry instead? Or you I try don't. to specify which basis you want. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's some spectrum. Yeah. So um so this was uh, so what you're saying is that since uh, the pole x gate is uh I apply the pole x gate. Mm. Maybe we take a small break, should we do that? Yeah, we stay. So, so we, we have reached the hour. So I'm sorry for the confusion. No, 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 no. Let's let's take a small break. Yeah, is that okay with everybody? Because we've been going on for forty five minutes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the the reason I changed from the four x eight to the four uh, to the x rotation uh, from the x rotation to the y rotation is because. Uh, uh, we were measuring uh, already in the X basis uh, since we have the hardware gates, and when we do rotation, we take it around the X axis, so it won't change the measurement outcome. Uh, so I just changed it to Y rotation. Um, when doing this in practice, uh, you will probably not only use a circuit with a simple one simple rotation, you will include, for example, C knots to generate entanglement and also maybe apply several rotations. So one X rotation, one Y rotation. So this is actually the first time I've encountered the problem in, in praxis. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, now that I've applied the Y rotation, I get different results for different uh, rotational parameters. So if I change this to, for example, 0 0.5, uh, the uh, rotational angle, I get different results. Now it's not just 50, 50 like it was. And uh, to calculate the expected value, you just take the um number of zeros and you multiply this with the constant in front of the poly x term so i don't know which value we should give it we could just give it a two i guess uh and then you when you measure the one states you get the minus one eigenvalue so that's why i introduce a minus sign here Now multiply with the constant and divide by the number of shots, which is 10,000 in this case. So this is just the, the eigenvalue I got. And the next step is then to just run this procedure again and again with different uh, 
different uh, rotational parameters and see which one gives the lowest energy. Um, are there any questions or something that's not clear for this? Um, so when doing this with uh, several qubits and more compl complicated Hamiltonians, you probably will have more than one rotational parameter. And it's not uh, computationally efficient to just search through with a sort of a, a brute force method by just trying out different parameters. Um, and I don't know how much I'll go into specific uh, techniques for this. Could this but, must happen with next time, right? Yeah. So, yes. so I can just mention briefly that uh, uh, many articles are using just uh, functionality in sci-fi. So they have like this classical uh, optimization routines. Uh, but also, you are able to cal calculate the gradient of uh, of your circuits uh, with just running the circuits twice. You can get the gradient of a specific parameter. So there are several ways you could uh, do this without having to search through a grid of parameters. So I was thinking of as a, as a possible option for as a continuation of one. The thing we could do for the project is to perhaps calculate the eigenvalues with the phase estimation algorithm as a kind of warm-up. And then if people would like to look at the optimization problem by itself, that is something which could also be a, a path for the, uh, for the project. If somebody is more interested in the optimization problem. Mm -hmm. So there are many options depending on what you'd like to uh, to dive into. Yeah. And you've been looking at the optimization from the point of view of quantum machine learning. Yeah. And that's, a, that's another issue which we could look at. Yeah. Before we proceed, what would you say would be the biggest challenge in trying to apply a machine learning algorithm to research and kind of find optimal? Yeah. So, uh... So uh, in in this specific case, uh, where you you're using these variational circuits, uh, one big problem is first you have to make sure that the circuit you're creating uh, is able to actually express the lowest energy state. Like the uh, accident case I brought up there, I just acted with a X rotation and thought everything was going to be good. But if I did that in practice, I would not be able to find those energy states. Uh, another problem is that uh, uh, even though you could possibly find the lowest energy with short circuits, uh, the gradients will vanish when you do the, the optimization, like exponentially in the number of qubits, which means that um, you will, you might uh converge towards your minima but it will go so slow that you will have to run the circuits uh, an exponential amount of times uh, which is a huge problem with this uh variational circuits um if that made sense uh, yeah, it makes sense so there are some ways to ensure that you get a uh, good behaving gradient but uh, the circuits have to be in this specific form, and they have to be uh, the the number of sort of the circuit depth or the uh, how long it takes to to uh, perform the circuits it has to be like think logarithmic in the number of qubits, so you're kind of restricted to very short circuits, mm -hmm. and those may not be uh, flexible enough to produce the ground states. Okay, uh, there. The the research in this field might have come further than I know of, but uh, at least last time I checked, that's one of the largest problems with doing this these variational circuits, both for ground state approximation and for machine learning component computers.
Are there any more questions or? Yeah, we're going to use Qiskit for the for the project. So I guess we will practice more and more. Now, you know, instead of bringing up new topics now, like the Hamiltonian and everything, I thought it's better if we just wait till next uh, Monday, because now I guess this is, uh, I guess it's more than enough to digest. And you should feel free to hang around if you want to, and then if you want to practice a little bit with Qiskit. So we could use the remaining time just to uh, discuss. And uh, if you wish to hang around, because then we just stop the recording here and uh, just open up for questions and ideas, what things you would like to do for the uh, project or anything you want to bring up. Right. I'm just going to stop.